spare, flee. Harry writes, It was hard seeing Chells at Willie's wedding. I don't think he's talking about his penis again, although I know it's tempting to believe that he is. After all, he appeared to be having a malfunctioning penis as a consequence of his earlier involvement with Dr. Dick. Instead, I think he's just talking about the feelings. Indeed, he goes on to explain, there were loads of feelings there. Feelings I'd suppressed. Feelings I hadn't suspected. He also felt a particular way about men trailing after her, wanting to dance. And, apparently, he admitted to being jealous. And he told her, and it made him feel a bit worse. And therefore, he felt it was necessary for him to move on and meet somebody new. Wow, he's got it all worked out, this boy, hasn't he? He laments whether time would work its magic on his heart. He says that his friends helped out trying to arrange dates, but nothing really worked. And then they mentioned a new name. It is the summer of 2011. Cast your minds back. Can you remember what you were doing in the summer of 2011? Do you really care? Well, Harry cares because he's relaying this in spare. And apparently, the next person was brilliant, beautiful, cool. Hang on a second. Harry's wife is allowing this to be written, but it's another five years before she makes an entry. Who could they be mentioning? Apparently, this person had just become single. And friends were saying that him and this magical person were well-matched. Are they suggesting that he goes out with a mirror? Who knows? But then it works out. They met at a bar and they got along and they had drinks. And then Harry said, let's all go back to Clarence's house for a nightcap. And then they sat around. And when the party broke up, he gave Florence, for that is her name. He gave Florence a lift home, but everybody called her Flea. Not as in run away, but as in the thing that cats and dogs have. What a delightful name. He goes to her house, and she says, come in for a cup of tea. I don't know if she winked when she said that, or whether she perhaps ran her tongue across her teeth or bit her lip, as if to say, come and give me your frostbitten tadger, you wild ginger-haired royal. Apparently, Harry told his bodyguard to go around the block a few hundred times. And then, they went inside. Anyway, Harry then tells us about the fact that one of Flea's ancient ancestors had led the charge of the Light Brigade, which the doomed advance on Russian guns in Crimea. And he recounts that this is a shameful chapter, the polar opposite of Rourke's drift. And then, over that cup of Earl Grey, he was asking himself, could she be my person? Apparently the connection was that strong. And they fought, the weeks that followed apparently were idyllic. They saw each other a lot. And they laughed a lot. And nobody knew. So it sounds like that was all very encouraging for him. I've no idea who this person is. He just calls her Florence or Flea. But then the press found out. And apparently Flea telephoned him. And she was very upset because there were eight paps outside her flat and they chased her across London. She'd seen her described as an underwear model based on a photo shoot done years and years ago. And she said that her life boiled down to one photo. And he said, well, I know what that's like. Apparently, they were giving her the full Caroline Flack treatment. Flea said, I can't do this. Harry felt like crying, but of course he didn't. Whether that's because he can't, or whether because he's made of stern stuff, we don't know, and we probably never will know. And he then provides us with another of the sort of idealised moments of the sort of Mills and Boone of his life. I had the phone on speaker. I was on the second floor of Clarence's house, standing by the window. 
surrounded by beautiful furnishings. Lovely room. The lamps were low. The rug at my feet was a work of art. I pressed my face against the window's cold, polished glass and asked Flea to see me one last time. At least, talk it over. Soldiers went marching past the house, changing of the guard. No. So evocative. Perhaps I'll pause here to allow those of you who are overcome by the conjuring up of such a marvellous scene to dry your eyes with a handkerchief or a Kleenex and to compose yourselves if you've come over all unnecessary as a consequence of my retelling of that magical, marvellous moment. Yes, how often have you ended a relationship as you've stood there with a rug at your feet that was a work of art as soldiers march past your window? Perhaps you ended up getting binned as your country was invaded and your hometown was being shelled to smithereens and the last of your worries was the fact that some bloke that you met for a bit of a bunk up two weeks ago at the dog and duck had gone tits up as a consequence of the invasion of your country. Apparently though he then got a call and was told that Flea had got back with the old boyfriend. Sorry about that Harry but some of us have got it and you haven't. You know she just couldn't help herself being drawn back to the Tudor what can I say? And there we are. Apparently he remarks about how the paps would hound her to the gates of hell, and that was what his mum said. Clearly this had quite an impact upon young Hal, because he stopped sleeping. Something, of course, that this publication will never help you get to. He explained that he stayed up night after night, thinking, wish I had a television. But now he was on a military base. Yes, all of a sudden he's gone from having a great old time with Flea before she got back with her old boyfriend. And here he is now in a military base again. He tried some herbal remedies. Oh yes, they helped a bit and he was able to get an hour or two. But they left him feeling brain dead most mornings. How did you know the difference? Then apparently he was on some manoeuvres. So they sent him over to America. And he spent a, a week or so hovering over a bleak place called Gila Bend, or Gila Bend. I'm sure those of you who know it will tell me the correct pronunciation, pronunciation of it. Apparently conditions were said to be similar to Afghanistan. So if you come from that part of the world, you'll be delighted to know that your area of the United States has been likened to Afghanistan. All the compliments, huh? Then he was off to Cornwall, a place called Bodmin Moor. It's January 2012. He went from blazing hot to bitter cold. And then he spent a few days trying to acclimatise, rising at 5am, doing a run, then barfing, and then going into the classrooms and learning about the latest methods that bad actors had devised for snatching people. He then was put on an exercise called Escape and Evasion, and it was one of the last hurdles before deployment. They were taken to an isolated spot, and they learned survival techniques, which included catching a chicken, killing it, plucking it, and eating it. I bet now when he sent to the chicken coop of despair, he thinks to himself, it's not a problem. I can kill the chicken. I can pluck the chicken. I can eat the chicken. That'll show her. That'll learn her. Then apparently it rained and he got very wet. They were then told to get out somewhere even more remote. And they were told that they should imagine that their helicopters had just crash-landed behind enemy lines and it was time to get out. They weren't overly impressed by this injunction, but nevertheless, they had to get on with it. And as a consequence of this, they then were a Christian army fighting a militia sympathetic to Muslims. And then they were left with a bivy bag and they weren't allowed any food. And off they went. And, apparently, they saw some farmhouses. Once upon a time, they, the locals would help out soldiers on exercise, but they've now been told not to do it. And so off they went, going through the dark, and it was freezing, it was raining, and they all curled up together to try and keep warm. And... They eventually got off to something which was vague, vague approximation of sleep. 
They had to get through some checkpoints and then they did it. Then they were loaded back onto a truck and then as they were heading back, they were suddenly ambushed by a group of men in camo jackets and black balaclavas. For some reason, Harry immediately thought of Lord Mountbatten being ambushed by the IRA. He didn't know why, but he thought about it. All of a sudden, they were individual, they put blacked out ski goggles over their eyes, zip tied their hands and dragged them off them. And they were taken into what sounded like an underground bunker system. Bags were ripped off and then they were being offered a glass of water. The next they'd be shoved to their knees and told to keep their hands above their heads and move from one stressed position to another. And they hadn't slept properly in 72 hours. Apparently much of what was done to them was illegal under the rules of the Geneva Conventions, but that was the point. And he said he was very cold. He hadn't been so cold. He said it was far worse than the North Pole. So I wonder this time if the pink pods became frostbitten or just turned into ice cubes. Who knows? And he explained, and once again we get his obsession with the penis, he explained, we were ordered to strip. They pointed our bodies, our flaccid cocks. They went on and on about how small. I wanted to say, you don't know the half of what's wrong with this appendage. He's absolutely obsessed with his dick, isn't he? It's quite staggering. I suppose it fascinates him, though. He's probably played with it more than anything else. And he explains how they were interrogated, and then they were uh, heard a violin, which sounded like it's being scraped by an angry two-year-old. And then one of the men who was called Phil, they'd gone through social media, and they started saying things about his family, his girlfriend. And it was astonishing how much he found that they knew about him. And of course, Harry's well used to this. Then one of the men grabbed him, shoved him against a wall, pressed his forearm into his neck, spitting every word from his mouth. I should imagine at this point, this was probably Prince Philip in disguise, thinking, fucking been waiting for this for years to give the little ginger runt a piece of his own medicine. And he probably didn't even realise that it was his grandfather that was giving him all of this shit. Indeed, it probably was the case, wasn't it? They thought, look, we need to get this little runt in line. And there was probably a queue of them all wearing balaclavas. Prince Philip, followed by Prince Charles, Uncle Andrew. I dare say they even allow Princess Anne in to give him a bit of what for to say, you know, he was a, a little shit when he was a kid, never did what he's told. Now let's get our own back on him. And... Indeed, a woman enters, and she went on and on about something he didn't understand and he couldn't keep up. And then he realised they were talking about his mum. And apparently, uh, this person said, Your mother was pregnant when she died, huh? With your sibling, a Muslim baby. And then he basically was thinking, Are you doing this for my benefit now or yours? Is this the, actually the exercise, or are you getting a cheap thrill? And then they were dragged out. And there was noise of gunshots and helicopter. And then that was the end of the exercise. And during the debrief, he was offered a half-arsed apology about the stuff to do. And the reason being was apparently it was difficult for them to find something about him that would be shot that they didn't know. And he didn't say anything to it. And he said, we needed you to be tested. And Harry stayed silent. But they admitted they took it a bit far. And apparently, two other soldiers in the exercise had gone mad. Shows, again, quite interesting, isn't it? This is the Ginger Prince who gets taken onto Bodmin, which is a pretty desolate place, believe me. And he's not given any food. It's pissing down. It's icy cold. And he has to find his way off the moor. And when he thinks he's done it and got his hopes up and thinks he's going to get warm after 72 hours of not really sleeping... They're ambushed and taken to what amounts to a detention centre and put through basically a form of torture and interrogation. So he deals with all of this and the provocation in relation to his mother, but then he gets all boo-hoo-hoo -hoo about his necklace getting snapped and falling onto a dog bowl. It's staggering, isn't it? So which is it? Did he never do this exercise and this is all made up to make him look macho? Or is all the other stuff actual crap? Does it show the sort of before Harry's wife and after Harry's wife, an individual who got his problems, but actually 
was able to go to the North Pole, was able to go to Iraq, was able to go to Afghanistan, went through all the physical training. Sure, he might not have had the brains at Sandhurst, but he did the physical training that's associated with it, and it isn't easy, believe me. And as a consequence of doing all of that, he shows a physical resilience. I think, I think it's fair to say that Harry does have physical capability. But then, the slightest thing sends him over the edge when it's to do with... Uh, with his wife and so forth and you really wonder has he turned into that much of a simp has he been emasculated to such an extent and it would appear to be the case and that is useful for you to make an understanding about how the narcissist can impact upon somebody yet another way that it is impacted upon harry so there we are interesting revelations there about flea but also about the exercise and what went on on that and of course more cock fascination on the part of harry what's coming up next well i can report to you that it's something called diana's baby join me there <laughs>